We hope that you enjoyed reading the paper on corticosteroids and antibiotics as much as we enjoyed writing it. At the time that we developed this study about a year ago, we were also very interested in finding out how prevalent the use of these two oral medications were throughout the United States for IVF. We developed a survey that we sent out by email that was anonymous and non-validated. We sent it to 376 centers across the United States and had 84 respondents and we were able to gain some pretty good insight. 61.7% of the respondents stated that they're still using an oral corticosteroid before their embryo transfers. 67.5% of these practices stated that they were using an oral antibiotic before embryo transfers, and this is completely separate from the use of an IV antibiotic that might be used for prophylaxis before procedures. Of the centers that responded and said that they were still using these medications, roughly 80% of them stated that they were providing them regardless of the stage of the transfer, and whether the transfer was a natural or programmed embryo transfer in a frozen cycle. We asked centers why they were giving these medications, what their stated reason was for, for providing either corticosteroids or antibiotics or both. 70% stated that they did not wish to change a practice that has worked in the past. Only 25% stated that they were giving these medications in line with evidence-based medicine. Open-ended responses to the survey generally acknowledged that the support of evidence for these medications was weak, but that the risk is relatively low, and so why not use them anyway? The responses suggested that there might be other possible benefits to these medications, such as anti-inflammatory effects on the endometrium. And interestingly, one center actually noted that they were concerned that discontinuation of these medications might put them in a poor light compared to their competitors. So in some cases, the use of these medications might actually just be an issue of keeping up with the Joneses. In addition to the use of antibiotics for female partners, we were also interested at this time in the use of antibiotics for male partners who were providing semen specimens for in vitro fertilization. We included this topic in our literature review and in our survey. The use of antibiotics for the male partner was even more difficult to trace back to its origins. We ended up having to email experts who were involved in the development of the protocol at the time, and we were able to find that it was its use it was first published in 1985 from Hewitt et al. in the Bourne Clinic in the UK. The purpose of the use of the antibiotic at that time was twofold. One was to avoid uh, the potential for infection in IVF media culture, and the other was to potentially treat either a real or transient leukospermia in those patients. The study that was published at that time included 46 control couples compared to only four couples with a leukospermia. And somehow these small numbers have translated to the use of antibiotics uh, prior to IVF for all male partners, regardless of a diagnosis of male infertility, uh, and certainly regardless of a positive semen culture, which I haven't ever even seen performed. Our survey concluded with questions regarding the use of oral antibiotics for the male partner in IVF, and approximately 40% of our respondent centers stated that they did still routinely provide an oral antibiotic prior to male partners who were providing semen for in vitro fertilization. The evolution of antibiotic and corticosteroid use in IVF has been fascinating to uncover, but the hard work that it required certainly drives home the point that old habits do die hard. Thank you for reading.